Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception, and we are back in the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, and we're picking up partway through the 19th verse. The 19th verse, it's interesting here in the English Standard Version, they've got a separation in the titles that they use with the 19th verse. And that's fine. It's just kind of interesting to note. Neither the verse divisions nor these headings are inspired. Paul didn't, or in this case, rather, Luke did not make this verse 19. He didn't, he didn't do that. That came later. But we've just finished up with that very important section, and you can go watch the video, Acts 9, verses 1 through 19. Paul's conversion, Saul's conversion, so much there, but now it's continuing on with what happened with Saul. We'll jump right in. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Think about this. Saul was just converted, and and we know the story. We know the story, but he had just been converted, and he had been converted from being diametrically opposed to the gospel, hostile to the gospel, seeking to arrest, imprison, and kill those who believed in the gospel. And now what does he do? Immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. He didn't wait around. He started right away. And that is Paul's way. Make no mistake about it. Paul, profound mind, greatest theologian ever, as far as just pure humans go, greatest theologian ever, tremendous mind, but he also possessed a zeal. He he had a zeal. He was zealous about persecuting the church. And now that he has become part of the church, he is zealous in his promotion of this truth that has changed his life. It's just who he was. And now that skill set, that gifting, because zealousness is a gift. It can be misused, misapplied, but it is a gift from God, just that drive to achieve things, to advance the cause, and the Lord is going to use that throughout the rest of Paul's life. But here, straight away, immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Complete turnaround from darkness to light, from opposition to belief. But how could he be so sure? How could he be so sure? And we could stop here and go on an aside about what faith is. What is faith? How do you know what you know? But Paul was convinced. It was part of who he was, now that he is a believer, that faith is something that cannot really be explained to an unbeliever. It cannot be rationally presented. We know what we know. It's confirmed by the Word of God. It's worked by the Word of God, the fact that we believe, the fact that Paul believed, is a miracle. And let's just go back for a moment and revisit. Jesus Christ brought Saul from death to life there on the road to Damascus. What happened? And you might even say, have some fun with this, you might even say he laid him low in the grave of death for three days. How long did Saul wait? How long did he sit in the darkness, the blindness, not eating, not drinking, until the Lord sent Ananias to come and proclaim the word to him? Saul was laid low in death, and a miraculous event took place. He was brought to life through the proclamation of the gospel when Ananias came to him. So also for us, for any believer, we are brought 
from death to life through the power of the gospel, that good news, that thing that is more than just a word. We are brought from death to life. And so we, the fact that we live, that we have that faith, okay, parallels there, same thing. The fact that we have faith is itself a miracle. What does that say to us about how we ought to cherish that gift? What does it say to us about how we ought to seek to pursue its leading, to allow it to take us through the word of God where it would have us go? There is something there. Christ is being formed in us. We are becoming little Jesuses. Yes, that's terrible grammar, but we are. That is who we are. It is what we are. It redefines us. Saul, and I'm, I'm not claiming that I could ever in any way approach Saul's capabilities, his, his ability to proclaim the word, to teach the word. I mean, the Holy Spirit chose this guy to write half the New Testament, right? Or close to it. But Saul, the thing that makes him stand apart, and yes, I'm bouncing back and forth between Saul and Paul, he just gave himself into it. Take me, lead me where you will go. And he went. So ought we not to pray for the gift of zealousness, that that God would just move us and, and that we in faith would follow that leading? But he's immediately preaching in the synagogues where in the lion's mouth, there to the Jews, the ones who are expecting him to come on one mission, he comes on another, and he is there to them proclaiming this message that Jesus is the Son of God. That was a powerful message. It's a powerful message to us, but for Jews, Old Testament believers, that's quite the powerful message, and it takes courage to go and do that, and we'll see that made quite clear in just a moment. And they were amazed. Isn't this guy the one who came and to wreak havoc? God used Paul because Paul himself was a message. What happened? The complete 180, the total change was itself a message and it had an impact. Paul's conversion spoke powerfully to those Jews who had not yet heard or had not yet believed. That was part of God's plan. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews. What what does the word confounded mean? What does the word confounded mean? Confounded is when in a debate, for example, one person presents things so clearly, so in a way that can't be challenged because the logic is obvious and the others are just they don't know where to go with that. How do we how do we respond to that? There's nothing we can say. He's blown all of our arguments out of the water, and we're just confounded, just befuddled. They had nothing that they could say. He confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus, because there were Jews everywhere, and let us remind ourselves of where Damascus is. Damascus, this is a different map, but Damascus was up here, so not all that far. Damascus, actually, you're farther that damascus was up here there were synagogues there what was a synagogue that's what we'd call a church that's where the people met there was only one temple there were many synagogues synagogues were the houses of prayer the places that jews would meet a place where they had a copy of the scriptures that they could use and teach and share confounding the jews who lived in damascus by proving that jesus was the christ now how did he do that That proving, that's a big word. You could say it's legal terminology. How did he do that? Again, God choosing Saul and intervening in his life in this miraculous way. Saul was equipped in a way that none of the other disciples were. They knew the word. They did. They were faithful. They weren't Pharisees. Saul knew it backward and forward. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the great teacher, Gamaliel, and no doubt was a star pupil. Saul knew the Old Testament, and the the degree to which these people knew the word would blow our minds. They didn't have the verse divisions and all of those things, and they could open up a scroll and find things and know right where it was. There are all kinds of examples I could give of how well they knew 
the word of God. They prided themselves on it. It was more about their own good works and the way most of them went about it. But still, they knew the word. So what do you think Saul was doing? From memory, he was pulling all of these passages, Genesis, Isaiah, wherever you want to go, the Psalms. Because once the Lord had changed his heart, he had the knowledge. He knew the book. And then his mind is making these connections. Martin Luther talked about in his tower experience, when it's called his tower experience, when he finally came to understand what the righteousness of God meant, that it wasn't a righteousness we had to measure up to, but the righteousness that God gives us, imputes to us as a gift through faith. He talked about in his mind, racing through the scriptures and seeing all the references that tied right in with it. He'd had the knowledge all along. He didn't have the foundation for it. Okay. Now the same thing in a bigger way with Saul. He knew the Old Testament. So once he was converted, once the Lord had brought him to life in faith, he was able to go to all these passages in the Old Testament. He didn't need a chart to tell him where the messianic passages in the Old Testament were. The things that David had said, Isaiah, Jeremiah, whoever you want to pick, Moses, he knew it. And he could give this to them in a way that they couldn't, they could not argue. So he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. He goes right to work. He goes right to work. And God used his gifting. He used his background. Saul didn't realize this. God had been preparing him all his life long to be the powerful proclaimer of the gospel that he was going to be. Saul didn't know that. Look at that in your own life. The things that you didn't know God was doing, but he was. He was because he has that power. He has that ability to work in history, to work in our own lives, and then apply it moving forward. What might God be preparing you for now, for what is coming? We need to spend some time thinking about that, prayerfully considering it. Asking the Lord to give us patience and understanding when we're going through hardship and adversity and suffering and disease and illness and poverty or financial struggles or work struggles, employment struggles, whatever it might be. Lord, I know you use this. I'm at peace with this because I know you're in charge and whatever is going on for me is what? It's best. It's best. Because the Lord knows, and he knows where things are going. When many days had passed, how how many days are many days? Not many, M-I-N-I, but many days had passed. We don't know. He was there for a while. Luke is making that clear. He was there for a while, teaching, preaching, proclaiming. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. It would just be interesting to take that phrase and look through the New Testament and see how many times that or similar phrasings appear. And and you could just look at it in Paul's life over and over and over again. The Jews plotted to kill him. We can't win. We can't shut him up. He's too smart for us. Let's kill him. Kind of like, well, the Savior that Paul is serving. He confounded them. They finally got to where none of them were going to speak to him anymore because he just blew them out of the water there in Matthew, the later chapters of Matthew. But their plot became known to Saul. Nothing can be kept secret for long. They were going to kill him, and Saul found out. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. Think about that. So Saul, at this point, has to have gone into hiding. He wasn't going to the synagogues anymore because he found out that they were going to kill him, and he's hiding. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. There's something important there that we'll miss if, if, if we don't stop and look carefully. I'm going to read it again. Verse 25. And you see if you can figure out what it is that I'm thinking about. And if you're regular listeners, you might say, we never know what it is you're thinking about. And that's That's okay. I understand. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. It's not about the basket. It's not about being lowered down from the wall. His disciples, he already had disciples. He had people who were following him, people who were listening. And that term disciple 
is not thrown around lightly. It is you connecting yourself with the teacher. Saul had been a disciple of Gamaliel. It was you following, saying, you teach, I listen. He had disciples. Just a a small point, but maybe not that small, of the power of what Saul was doing there, because that stands in contradistinction to the fact that these people wanted to kill him. The gospel's growing. The gospel's flourishing. And these people want to kill him. It's so bad, and Saul will refer to this later and see if I can find here in 2 Corinthians 11, and I'm not going to jump to it and read it, but basically he talks about this being part of his humiliation. The, they were after him. You know, like being lowered down in a basket so you can escape the bad guys. They took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Now, let's go back to Ananias. What had Ananias been told to tell him? Back in verse 16, in red letter, right? This is... Jesus speaking to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. He didn't have to wait long. He didn't have to wait long. The suffering was coming. And then when you look at Paul's life in its entirety, As he recounts there in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, the hardships that he went through in his ministry, it was nonstop. Paul was going to suffer a lot. And and we talk about that and we acknowledge that, but it's like we set it aside. Like there are two books on, on Paul. One is this amazing theology and the teaching and the proclamation and the story of him going from place to place and sharing the gospel. And then kind of over here, there's this little volume that's, you know, very compact, but very intense about Paul's suffering. We separate the two in our minds and it's not healthy. It's not healthy because when, when you effectively proclaim the gospel and it's not a mamby pamby thing, it's not a bowl of milk toast. It is a powerful message that divides soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning, dividing the attitudes and intentions of the heart. There is a negative response to that. Always there is a positive response to that as well as God blesses it. As I record this, as I record this, it's it's the day after the opening ceremony for the Olympics where they had a mock Lord's Supper with transvestites, all kinds of craziness. It was openly mocking Christianity. Christianity isn't welcomed by the world, period. It's not welcomed by the world. It is opposed, and that is only going to become more and more and more the case. I think back to the first Olympics that I remember watching, and I remember it because there was a very memorable event. Mark Spitz won six gold medals, 1972 Olympics. Could you imagine what would have happened if anything like that had happened at those Olympics in 1972? You did have the the shootings that went on and the Olympics ended up being shut down, but Mark Spitz got to win his medals first. The world is growing more hostile to the gospel. Why? Because the proclamation of the gospel is on the decrease. It's moving backward. It is not across the board advancing. And where the light of the gospel isn't shown brightly, clearly to keep the beasts back in the darkness, the beasts, the opposition advance out of the darkness and the darkness grows, reference revelation. But where the gospel is proclaimed, there is opposition. And we see that in the life of Paul. What does that encourage me to do? What does it call upon me to do? It calls upon me to go deeper into the Word of God, be rooted, grounded on the rock that cannot move. It, it, it beckons me to draw closer to my Savior, to hold fast to his hand and not let go and trust in him and in humility to say, lead me where you will. Whatever that is, I'm okay because I'm with you. I'm more then okay, because I'm with you. And to the degree 
that I have trouble saying that, then all the more I need to be strengthened in his word and in his mighty power. It is the way of things always, but especially, I think, in this latter day. We see what's going on in the world and the realization that even here in the West, actual persecution for our faith could become a reality. So now, Saul goes down to Jerusalem. And when he had come to Jerusalem, because he was let down that basket, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he was welcomed with wild applause and greetings, and everyone loved him. No. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. We can understand that. We can understand that. It could be a ruse. They knew full well. He'd blown up Jerusalem before he left. Now some of them have come back in. But Barnabas, remember Barnabas? He sold a field, sold some property, and gave it to the church. Barnabas, who's known as the son of encouragement. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Again, he had seen the Lord. He saw Jesus. Reference our last video. Acts 9, 1 through 19. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. That phrase, he went in and out among them, he was welcomed. He was accepted. He was one of them. And it didn't take them long to see, man, that guy's got skills. That guy's a powerful proclaimer of the word. No, no wonder the Lord Jesus did the spectacular thing he did in converting him. I bet you the Lord's really going to use him. I would think that those might have been some of the thoughts that the people in the church there had. But he's, again, preaching boldly, preaching boldly, no fear, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. It's always about the Lord. It's never about Paul. And, and that's one of the struggles, keeping the focus on it being about the Lord and not about us. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, and they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Now, who are the Hellenists? Who are the Hellenists? They are the ones who started to mix it up with Stephen back in Acts 6, 9 through 10. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and, and that means they, they were Hellenists. They were from outside of Israel. And these things, these distinctions, and we're going to see it more here as we get into the section here with Peter, these people groups, we need to stop and think about. And, and you probably, frankly, need some references to do that because it's not part of our vocabulary. We don't know who these people are. It's like going back in history and, and reading something in European history and, and not knowing who the different people groups were. If you don't know who the Normans and the Saxons are, it's hard to make much sense out of European history. It's important. The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews. They were more Hellenized, meaning that culturally they were more like the Greeks than they were like the Jews. They were Greek-speaking. They, they may have known some Hebrew, but there was a difference. They were, they were a different group. And it's important because in this case, they're also the ones who mixed it up with Stephen. So they had power, they had clout, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. We're going to go back to our map because we like maps because maps make it easy to follow along. So here's our map, and I do like the, the big pointer reference here. You're seeing the whole Mediterranean, this end of the Mediterranean. He'd gone up to Damascus. He came back from Damascus. Now he's going to Caesarea, shipping port. You're going to catch a boat. That's where you went, and back up to Tarsus, Saul of, what? Saul of Tarsus. He's going back to his home city for right now. Next verse, and it's, it's important. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up 
and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Look at the terms here, the geographical terms, Judea, Galilee, Samaria. And you will be my witnesses, Acts 1.8. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and all the ends of of the earth. It's like Luke is saying here, see, we've advanced this far. This is going on. This is where things are. Is that map of progression of how the gospel was supposed to spread. But there's something else. Now we're back at peace. But when Saul was converted, and it's not said in the text, we're deducing here, but it's definitely borne out in what we see, that persecution against the church fizzled. So who was driving it? And if you've got this big persecution of the church going on, the sect, this group called The Way, and it's being led, spearheaded by this guy, Saul, and then he becomes one of them. You might think, we better quit or we'll lose more people. We send anybody else after him, they'll get converted. So whatever the reasoning was, which we're not told, that attack on the church, that time of persecution, hostility, hardship, it fizzled out. And now the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was being built up. Is that God saying he had it wrong before allowing the church to be persecuted? Is the church never going to be persecuted again? No, none of, the, none of those things are true. Persecution comes and persecution goes. And it is always, always under the domain of the Lord Jesus Christ who rules all things for the sake of his church. All is going to write that in Ephesians 1, verse 20. He rules all things for the sake of his church, and sometimes that involves persecution, and sometimes it involves a time of peace and blessing and growth. These things that God does, his timing is mysterious to us. His ways are beyond tracing out as the heavens are above the earth. So higher his ways above our ways. We don't know, we don't understand, and we shouldn't question. The only question should be when my life goes from a time of prosperity and comfort to a time of of hardship or vice versa, is, Lord, how would you have me serve you in this present situation? Because I say this regularly. I probably don't say it enough. I probably don't remind myself of it enough. I'm not that smart. I don't know that much. I can't see tomorrow. I don't understand yesterday. Maybe 10 years from now, I'll understand yesterday. It's the way it goes. Some of these things are easier to see as you grow older. And I'm not saying you have to be as old as me but they're easier to see when we grow older because we see God reminds us, remember that terrible, awful thing that happened and you thought I didn't love you and you thought it was all over. And look at how I use that. Look at how I use that to prepare you for what you're doing here. Now, how you're serving here. Now, how you're being a blessing and a comfort to others here. Now, Paul talks about that very thing, comforting others with the very comfort with which we ourselves were comforted. The Lord does things in his way, and his way is best. I know my way. I know where it goes. I know where it has taken me. It's a hot mess. I'm going to lean in, draw all the closer, hold tighter to his hand, because faith is a hand-in-hand walk with the Lord, and trust in him and say, okay, Lord, here we go. I'll follow. And in our prayer life, we need to talk to him about that. How do, how do I understand this? Teach me, remind me. And if my nose isn't firmly planted in the word of God, and that's the picture of having a book in front of my face, then things aren't going to make sense and I'm not going to understand. But when he shows me the travails of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, I go, oh, yeah. But when I see his mighty workings leading them out of Egypt in the Exodus, I go, oh, oh, yeah. When I see his working and comfort in in the life of David as Saul pursued him unjustly and unfairly and how the Lord used that, I say, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. But the combination of the two, praying for the right heart and desire to see it and being in the word so that it's there for me is vitally important. The Lord's ways are mysterious. That's okay. I'm okay with that. I don't want a God I can understand. I'll say that again. I don't want a God that I can understand. I don't want a God who's so small that my mind 
can comprehend him. That's a puny God. Think of that Avengers movie where, where Hulk wax on what's his name, bounces him back and forth and says, puny God. I don't want a puny God. I want the mighty God, the, the inscrutable God beyond tracing out and figuring out that I have because he uses all that awesome, mighty power for me, for you. That's the God I want. And that's the God the children, his children, his believers had here. They get to enjoy a time of peace. Use it well. You know what the problem with peace and prosperity is? Fat and lazy. That's the problem with peace and prosperity. Just sit back. Oh, everything's good. We don't have to do anything. No fires to fight. What do firemen do when they're not fighting fires? They polish trucks and they work out. They practice, right? So we should do. Use the time wisely. All right, we continue on. Now, another thing here, just big picture concept with the book of Acts. It's been about the disciples in Jerusalem. Now we went to this. We had the stoning of Stephen, the persecution, Saul and his conversion. And now, boom, we're back here with Peter. We're back here with Peter. We're back for our last stint with Peter because the book, led by the Holy Spirit, Luke is going to follow the ministry of of Saul. But at this point in time, it's back to Peter. Not like, oh, well, we'll give Peter his last hurrah. This is an important section. What we're going to go through from here all the way to the end of really chapter 11, vitally important in that geographic spread of the gospel that we talked about. It's, that's what this section is about right here. Not about healing Aeneas, about the spread of the gospel to more different people groups. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, what, what's Peter doing? He wasn't sitting back just reading the scrolls. As Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. And you know what we're doing now, right? So he's coming over here. Here's Jerusalem. He's going over to Lydda. We'd say over. They go down. Why? Because he's leaving Jerusalem. When you left Jerusalem, you went down. It's the most high city, God's, God's home in their cosmic geography. And so he went down to Lydda. That's where he's going. So he's kind of going farther out. He's over here. You're not far from Joppa, over here at the coast. We'll talk about all these. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he arose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. We're getting out here farther with these groups of people. We're not quite there yet. We're going to get there when we get to Joppa. These people who are far away from the center of Judaism, who are thought of as, okay, yeah, they're Jews, but and they're not really Jews. They're, they're kind of those people who live out there. They've been influenced by these other cultures. You know, we're the real Jews. They're the lesser Jews, and among them are far more Gentiles. Spread of the gospel. Peter's out here, and he heals this guy named Aeneas. He'd been bedridden for eight years, paralyzed. And at least he had a family that cared for him because he's in a bed. He's not put out somewhere where he was begging, which was often, often the case. And Peter is led to heal him. Now, let's talk healing just really quickly. We don't know why some people are healed in the New Testament and others aren't. It doesn't say God told him to heal this guy. It doesn't say that. We, we can deduce, assume that that's what happened, but it doesn't say that. He heals him. This guy needed healing. Peter healed him. But what's the point? There is a pattern in the book of Acts that as the gospel spreads and it goes into a new region with a new people group, whatever, that's where we find these miracles. It's the ringing of a loud bell that says something special here. It is the, the great big firework, the Roman candle that goes up into the sky. Boom. Something special here. You better come look and see. That's how it's used. And we see the pattern that that's where it takes place. Same thing can be said. And we'll talk about it with the, with the gift of tongues, where it's talked about and seems to be important. Because look here, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord, all of them. It says all of them now. 
that's a pretty powerful term. This had effect. God is putting a flag in the ground and saying, I'm claiming this territory too. And don't forget the reclamation of the nations moving out with the gospel, freeing people from the tyranny of the fallen ones who still rule in this world today. Reference the opening ceremony for the Olympics in France. Don't tell me they don't rule. They do. So he's gone out here, way out here, and Lydda, there's another place in there called Sharon, close by, and the gospel is spread powerfully. Now he's going to go farther. Now there was in Joppa, that was just on up the road, about 12 miles on the coast, coastal cities, coastal cities. Think of, think of cities that have naval ports. You've got that amalgamation of cultures and, and peoples and the like. Now, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity, and in those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon Anner. So he's been here at Lydda, Tabitha, Dorcas, lives in Joppa. She dies. They send two men. Keep that in mind. He's going to have that happen again very soon in the incident with Cornelius. But it's like he keeps getting pulled farther and farther and farther out. And here... What do you notice about Tabitha? She's a disciple. She's a believer. The word had gotten there already. Maybe they'd been there, her and her family, at the day of Pentecost. Who knows? Maybe it had to do with the the, the ministry of Philip as he went around that region preaching and proclaiming the gospel. We don't know, but she's a believer, and she was someone who really lived her faith. She took care of the other widows or of widows, special, faithful woman. Back in the day when I was young, and it's all the way back when I was young, there were, in some churches, they would have groups of women that they'd call themselves the Dorcas Society. That was before Dork became a term, and and that probably had to do something with that, that phrasing going away for these groups. But they would do things. They would do charitable works for people in the church who needed support, who needed help whatever it might be. And what did she do? Acts of charity. And she became ill and she died. And they send for Peter. And Peter is drawn farther out. And yes, she's a believer. What doesn't it say? Was she a, was she a Jew? Just that she's a disciple. Interesting. There's a lot that we don't know. We know the most important thing. She's a believer. But as to whether she was a Jew or not or a Gentile, we would assume she's probably Jewish connection, proselyte at least, and proselytes were those who would convert to Judaism from the outside. But she died, and again, we had him heal Aeneas, who was paralyzed for eight years. Now, Dorcas, Tabitha, is raised from the, and the two words mean the same thing, two different languages. You know, when you're in a multi cultural, multilingual area. It's this in one language, this in the other language. It means the same thing. And what is that word? Let's see. Use my cheat note here. Aramaic name Tabitha and the Greek name Dorcas both mean gazelle. Interesting. Her name was gazelle. And gazelles are beautiful, graceful little animals that run fast and can jump really high. Peter is led whatever way he's praying. And who knows what Peter thought when he went in there with her and and knelt down to pray by the body. No doubt the Lord let him know what he was to do, but he raises her from the dead. No small feat. And I didn't think of this before and, and, and look into it, but how many times in the New Testament 
other than it being Jesus, that someone is raised from the dead. Pretty short list. Pretty short list. Pretty amazing thing. She's raised from the dead. And what's the result? And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed there in Joppa with a certain Simon, a tanner. Now, question. Given the geography, and and Joppa's there on the coast, how long do you think that it took the word from Joppa to get to Caesarea? Somebody was brought back from the dead, and, and they weren't distracted by sporting events by what was going on in Major League Baseball or or soccer or entertainment on TV. Word spread quickly as a result of Peter bringing this woman back from the dead and also that he'd healed this paralyzed guy here. There's this powerful message, a spiritual message, a message of life that is here. And we're going to see when we go into chapter 10, no doubt that played a part in Cornelius reaching out to Peter, which is, as we look at this development, those rings, concentric rings of the gospel expanding out, 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 as Jesus said it would, we are at a huge inflection point here. Things are getting ready to take off and go, and Peter is the one who's a big part of this. And in just a, a thought, and I'll try to save it in my in my rusty attic of a brain for next time, and maybe we can discuss it a little then. It's Peter who's doing this. This is groundbreaking stuff with what's going to happen in chapter 10 with going to Cornelius. Read it. It's Peter, not Paul. It's, it's Peter, the one who arguably at this time is the head of the church. He's the pillar. He's the one who's always been there, the outspoken one. He's the one with this change from Jew to Gentile. It's Peter, not Paul. Interesting that the Lord did it that way, and we will spend some time contemplating that next week. Do appreciate you being here. I hope, I pray that this ministry, this teaching is a blessing to you. If it is, share it with others. More than anything else, share it with others. One of the ways you can share it with others is give it a give it a thumbs up, leave a comment. Those things make a big, big difference in this getting out to more and more and more people. This is Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.